Okay. So let's kind of focus. We're, uh, we're getting to, in order to understand El Nino and La Nina conditions, we need to understand what normal conditions are normal or neutral conditions. So normally we have this nice, healthy, strong, easterly uh, trade wind. And so this, what the trade winds do is create this nice, strong, um, easterly equatorial current. Okay, and then what that does is it, here in this, this part of, uh, this would be what the South Pacific Ocean gyre, um, We have a nice, uh, nice, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, the Peruvian current here is nice and strong, and we have a nice um, outgoing current here, and we have a lot of upwelling. Well, the right amount of upwelling, I should say. And what upwelling does is it makes people here in South America happy because uh, they're, they need it for their fishing industry and actually it has also other consequences, a nice, healthy uh, climate environment for those folks. Okay, so this is under normal conditions. Notice what we tend to have then is um, uh, we tend to have kind of relatively warmer water here, kind of a low pressure here in Indonesia. This is the Indonesian islands over here. Okay, that's normal. Well, during an El Nino event, we have certain things kind of we can start off with what happens first. Well, our easterly trade winds are not as strong as usual. In fact, sometimes those easterly trade winds can even reverse themselves. So that has consequences to that South Pacific, um, well, all the ocean gyres. But what happens to the Peruvian current there along South America, the west coast of South America, is it's not as strong as it was. So here we see, um, actually, instead of having, do you remember how this was a nice, strong, healthy um, current before? Well, it's not like that now. You actually see a westerly countercurrent going. Okay, um, this would be uh, where the trade winds converge, and so this would be our uh, uh, at our intertropical convergence zone, or below our intertropical convergence zone. So notice all sorts of consequences then. You see the Peruvian current? It's not doing its thing. And so if it's, it's not doing its thing, what we end up with is... Um, what we end up with are warmer conditions. Let me just go ahead and reveal this. What we end up is with no upwelling. The people over here who are counting on the fishing industry and things like that, this is my little sad face. Okay, I don't know. I don't live there, so maybe somebody else would have a different view. But during an El Nino event, from what I understand, the upwelling has consequences on the fishing industry. And... Um, and these El Nino events, I mean, they're definitely periodic, so it's not anything that they haven't lived with before. But notice that it tends to be generally warmer over here, and then it's cooler over here than usual. It's cooler and drier. And notice that we have a high pressure over here and kind of a low pressure over here. And actually, that's why we have notice the... Um, we don't have our strong, uh, well, I guess I would say easterly from east to the west uh, current. And actually, you've probably heard that an El Nino event can actually affect us up here too as well. Specifically, during an El Nino, we tend to have cooler and wetter than average winters. Um, and then uh, up here, this part of the neck of the woods, which I'm not from necessarily, their winters are warmer than average. So with all of that said, I'm gonna kind of bring you up to date here in a minute, but as of spring 2012, we are, well, it looks like we're coming out of a La Nina and maybe going to enter an El Nino here coming up soon. But the point is, is that what's happening, I, I am kind of fascinated by this, because what's happening here in this neck of the woods actually affects us throughout the world and not just our fish prices. 
So um, just to kind of recap, El Nino events will ultimately uh, drive uh, warm water towards that west coast of South America. The upwelling shuts down. Um, they we, they lack now the that west coast. They aren't getting their uh, nutrients from the bottom of the ocean like usual. Okay, fishing economy suffers. Um, that has effects for, of course, inland. Well, inland, I didn't mention this, but inland will, during an El Nino event, generally receive more rainfall. And those folks on the other side of um, of the um, the Ocean Basin Gyre, they actually are drier. You saw that on the previous slide. Folks in Australia and Indonesia can be experienced droughts in El Nino events. Okay, and like I said, the the you know f folks all throughout the world are affected by an El Nino event. It's not just that neck of the woods. Um, and it varies. It can go from drought to heavy rains. Um, Tropical cyclone activity is diminished. Now, I just recently looked this up. Actually, during an El Nino, I had to, con I had to, hurricanes in, uh, how does that go? I just looked it up. I want to say hurricanes in the Atlantic increase, I want to say. No, that's wrong. Oop, I had that wrong. Hurricanes in the Pacific increase. And most of our major hurricanes come from the Atlantic Ocean. So this is right. Tropical cyclones or hurricanes, let me go ahead and say um, in Atlantic Ocean. So that is right. Diminish. Oh, but here's what I just recently looked up. What it means for us in the Midwest is that if El Nino in place, this will increase are tornadoes in Midwest. There you go. So fewer Atlantic hurricanes, increased tornadoes, and actually we could have more Pacific hurricanes. Um, so here's another kind of look at El Nino conditions. First starting out with normal conditions. So during a normal year, <coughs> We tend to have this high pressure over here in the vicinity of the west coast of South America and that uh, and low pressure there in Indonesia, um, Australia. And so we have a nice strong equatorial current from the east to the west. Again, this is uh, associated with the intertropical convergence zone. Okay, strong trade winds. Um, Notice that we kind of have this sort of, I think I've heard this called the walker cell, where we kind of have this sort of circulation uh, kind of from the Earth's surface in, into the upper parts of the atmosphere. So during normal conditions, um, over here tends to be kind of dry. When I say over here, I mean kind of off the, um, would be the northwest of South America. Over here, we tend to have nice and wet conditions. Okay. Now, if we compare that uh, to an El Nino, when an El Nino event is in place. So I mentioned instead of a high, we have a low over here. And instead of a low, we have a high over here. So if air moves from high to low, there you go. That's kind of what's driving our basically um, unusual movement of, of uh, water from the west to the east there. Okay, our trade winds weaken or peter out. We end up with wet conditions over here um, off the northwest coast of uh, South America and dry conditions here in Indonesia and Australia. Now at the end of an El Nino event, we tend to kind of reverse and swing into a La Nina event, or what we call La Nina conditions, and everything is reversed. So La Nina conditions look more like a normal year, except it's just a little stronger than usual. Let me show you what that looks like. Well, I guess I don't have a slide to show you. Um, so a La Nina is then going to go ahead, and if you picture a normal year, what a La Nina would look like is you have a high pressure here 
but I'm going to put an HH for it's very high. Our, tr our trade winds intensify and we have an unusual amount of upwelling and it has consequences as well. Okay, so what's called the southern oscillation is kind of the back and forth between the El Nino and La Nina. Okay, La Ninas, um, like I said a minute ago, are kind of an intensification of the, the normal conditions of the easterly trade winds. Um, and during a La Nina, upwelling is enhanced and they will receive even less rain than usual there off of the northwest coast of South America. Um, Australia and Indonesia may experience floodings. They're re receiving even more rain than usual. And again, La Nina can definitely have, its con have an effect um, throughout the world as well. Bringing drought and, um, drought and rain um, to various locations. So uh, if we look at tropical cyclone or hurricane activity, then actually a La Nina does enhance, um, if we want to kind of put a qualifier there, it enhances hurricanes in the Atlantic, which are our most noteworthy Atlantic Basin, Ocean Basin. North Atlantic Ocean Basin? I don't know if it's the south too, but. And the presence of a La Nina event will diminish tornadoes. So I don't know, just in general, it's only, only one factor. Oh, well, let me go back. I was going to go ahead and take you to the, well, that's okay. I will post uh, the website how you get the current information on El Nino versus La Nina event. It's so interesting how they're, they are so up to date with what sort of event do we have. Um, again, it's just that neck of the woods, but it's also globally. So um, you would expect during a, uh, this says El Nino event, during an El Nino event you're going to have unusually warm conditions. Now this over here is South America. Okay, and this is the, um, up here is Mexico, and so over here would be our um, Australia and Indonesia. So what you're looking at here during an El Nino is surface temperatures are plus, are warmer than they should be. If we compare that to a La Nina event, uh, during a La Nina event we're seeing that temperatures are cooler than they should be are normally off of the coast of South America. So the El Nino Southern Oscillation is looking at the kind of going back and forth between El Nino and La Nina conditions. Um, and I mentioned that it's just so interesting if you get a chance to look at um, weather folks tracking the conditions uh, in that area, which apply actually globally. Um, it's just not a simple thing. But when you look at this, you can see how they've kind of gone back and forth. The, um, the red are La Nina. Sorry, the red are El Nino. That's what I forgot. That's what I thought. So El Nino events in, um, are up here and La Nina down here. But what I saw was that it's looking like beginning June, July or so, we're going to kind of segue from La Nina to neutral to El Nino. So it is very interesting.